So hello and thank you for joining us um, for our monthly webinar. And today's topic is on the project management office. Together, we're gonna talk about what really makes the project management office work. And we'll go through certain insights that hopefully will generate further discussion and thoughts among yourself as you see how you fit uh, in the project management office world. So today's topic is establishing and operating world-class PMO. My name is Dr. T. Wu, and I'm the presenter. Um, I have quite a bit of experience in project management office, leading some and leading and building some of the larger program and project management volunteer with PMI and as such I dabble in various standards on risk and portfolio for example we recently published a book on that uh, as well as my company being the CEO of PMO advisory we built as well as lead um, PMOs for various organizations so today's presentation really reflects uh, a lot of our experience in our uh, sort of wisdom that we gather over time. A little bit about my company, uh, PMO Advisory LLC. We are a PMI registered education provider, 4172. And you can see the broad range of classes that we offer. Our courses are actually really in five categories. There are four of them are in training. The fifth one is certification bootcamp. So what we do is we organize almost all our training into webinars, which really is an hour. You can earn PDUs. It's usually for free for our clients. And the primary learning objective is to create awareness. So really try to be thought provoking. The next series training is around insights. These are about three to four hours, short enough, but also long enough to get into some level of detail. The learning objective is really around perceptivity and also help you to create that vision of what you want to achieve. The next series, a little bit longer than that, are the fundamental courses. These are really just one day, six to eight hours. And it is offered multimodal, so sometimes we offer in classroom as well. And these are really around comprehension and intuition. So giving you enough knowledge for you to really understand and develop your own sense of what that means. The last series uh, that we do are implementation. And we're still building a lot of the courses. These are two, three, four days classes. And they really aren't focusing on application and acumen. Now, we do have a series of training courses um, around the boot camps. So, for example, a lot of these have PMI certification, PFMP, PGMP, et cetera. And you can see some of our offering there. So that's just a little bit about PMO advisory. Today, for this webinar, our focus is really on explaining the concept of PMO, what are the benefits, what are the challenges, why is it becoming so po uh, popular, why is about 80% of Fortune 500 companies have PMOs, what are the different type of PMOs, and there are many categories out there, so we present how we view the world, uh, and then explain the key activities in both the operation and sustainment of PMOs. So this is uh, what, what you currently see. So let's start with what is a PMO? Uh, a PMO generally stands for Project Management Office. Uh, now, it can actually also mean Program Management Office, as well as it can mean Portfolio Management Office. So it does depend a little bit on the context. But unless somebody sp speak otherwise, at least about 80% of the time refers to Project Management Office. And as such, it is defined as a management framework. It's a central management framework, which assists in the sharing of methodology, leading practices, resources, techniques, tools, as well as standardization of the governance process that are related to project. In some ways, PMO is a non-standard term. Uh, again, because it could mean project program portfolio, but even within the world project management, it's a non-standard term because it is very difficult to bring and put a boundary around PMOs. Chances are in an organization, a large organization, you have multiple PMOs and they do things slightly differently or they cover slightly different scope. 
So in some ways, you could look at PMO as really just as an organic, centralized organization designed to manage a fairly intense project environment for that particular organization. And when I say organization, it could be referring to a company, so enterprise PMO, departmental level, so department PMOs, sometimes even PMOs for a particular group of people. Um, so there could be different levels of PMOs. Oops, sorry. So and th that's what I was getting to. Um, there's actually a study conducted some years ago and looked at what are the various type of PMOs and comes by different names. So you can see this little research done by Brian Hobbs um, and Monica Aubrey, and they looked at the various names that PMO come with. And what's interesting, of course, is that there's about 12% of them comes with just a great variety of different names. It just doesn't show up. Could be sort of competency center for project, for example. But the other names that shows up that at a pretty high clip is PMO, Program Management Office, Profis, Project Support Office. Um, typically some names similar to Project Management Office, but one word different. So for example, Project Department, Project Management Department. Um, and so on and so forth. And there is a classification, there's actually almost no name, but they do some of the functions. So what the takeaway here is, it doesn't really matter how this call your organization, it really matters what the centralized office really do. So it's a very functional view of what PMO is. The value of PMO, despite its name, is really around allocating resources, managing projects and programs involving stakeholders, monitoring compliance, developing policies. It could also be focused on coaching and mentoring team members, equipping them with the needed skill uh, and the expertise. Sometimes PMOs can perform audits in solving challenges. So here, as you alluded to here in these three bullets, it, there's a sort of broad overview of many different capabilities that a PMO can possibly have. Building a case for PMO, why do organizations need PMO? And there are a great variety of many reasons. Um, the way I look at it, and from my experience, is it's a very natural outgrowth as the environment the organization becomes more intense with project. So for example, if you're the CEO of a company and you're doing three projects and you have three people leading it, is it so difficult to work with those three people getting different reports and even if the reports don't report the same way. So for example, one person may report the health using traffic color, red, green, and uh, yellow. Another person using some scale, one to five, and a third person using good, great, and poor. If it's only three people reporting to the CEO, probably yeah, it's a little bit headache trying to figure out all the language, but it's quite doable. Now imagine that three projects goes from three to 13, 13 to 30, 30 to 300, 300 to 3000. So you see my point, even if you are the most intelligent person in the world, at some point, it just becomes mind boggling. And this is where CPMO naturally comes out to say, okay, well, we'll try to do better. Let's organize this. Hey guys, let's see if we could, um, report PMO in the same way, let's say using the traffic color or scale one to five. And if you think having a couple thousand projects is crazy, one of the customer we have, uh, it's an iconic company, it's an iconic US company, not a very big company though, it's about 6,500 people. They, one time uh, the CFO essentially sort of got fed up with all the project requests and directed one of the executive directors to essentially go around the company and count how many projects they have. And, and they define project pretty uh, serious way too. They didn't just say any activity. They define the project is over a certain scale, certain number of resources, certain duration, budget. And by the time they finished counting, they were just utterly shocked to learn that the organization have 3,000 projects. Now 3,000 projects in a company of 6,500 people is a lot of projects. So again, now you can see the power of the PMO. So immediately they went to a hyperdrive trying to figure out what well, do we really need those 3000 projects? Can we combine them? Can we eliminate them? Surely there are duplicate efforts 
or at least better efforts spent on doing one versus the other. Uh, and that's some of the work that we help them do. So that's really one big reason. I think that reason alone and by itself is enough for PMOs um, to become a very vital entity for organization. But there could be other reasons, and these reasons are not necessarily mutually exclusive. You could have multiple of these reasons, right? Another reason, of course, is PMOs, projects, programs, uh, even portfolios. These are temporary, especially project. The definition of project is a temporary endeavor. So it comes and goes. But do the organization really want to reinvent the wheel? And the answer, of course, is not. So if you could have a PMO there to help sort of look after the sustainability, the consistency of delivery, the repeatability. To me, those are really the overarching drivers. And of course, they're additional. Can we do skill building? Absolutely. Can we do portfolio management, prioritization, strategic planning, decision support? Answer, clearly yes. But really the fundamental reasons, I think, is what I just described. And that's why in one of our, our client organization, uh, and they are a telecommunication company, very large one in the United States, they counted how many PMOs they have. And at some point they lost count, but they got into the number like 40. And of course, not necessarily all organizations are called PMOs, but they could have related name. So that shows you uh, the proliferation in this case of PMO. Again, there are many, many benefits. Um, if nothing else, if you have organization that have a lot of project managers, then that having that natural home of PMO provides that sense of belonging, the natural home for people to brainstorm, to cry over projects, and maybe to share best practices or what works and what are some of the learning. Others, performance summary, organization management, organization asset, Discipline, methods and approach, execution, methods and infrastructure, sharing of the tools, past experiences, consist consistency of results. And then ultimately, I think sort of the higher order goal is really to help the senior level executives make those strategic decisions. There are many challenges in PMO. Challenges in PMOs ranges actually is pretty interesting. PMOs can actually get killed, so to speak, um, by being both too successful and unsuccessful. Uh, and I'll come to that. But they fail for a variety of reasons, um, many of which are actually external to the PMO self. So it could be organization or just even the broader environment. The top reasons for PMO failure and just focusing on the PMO itself is really the lack of executive support. If for whatever reason, the executive who started it move on, especially move out the organization and the incoming one may not have the same enthusiasm, well, that is usually a problem. If the PMO does become too bureaucratic um, and overburden the organization, with processes, documentation, rules, it really becomes the police and the auditor, then they may be seen as really becoming a policeman um, and others may see as bureaucratic. So they could be hated by all professional. Now, to be fair, chances are PMO trying to optimize the overall process will have some degree of bureaucracy. Some people will say, well, it's not really suited for my project. So there's almost always a degree of that. But where you tilt on that scale is quite, quite important. Three, support supply and demand processes. Um, somehow PMO just has that disconnect. There's a huge demand for work for whatever reason they cannot fulfill or do it well. Or the other side, they have too much resource sitting idle, which of course, as you can imagine, is an organization time spell that is right for, um, right for culling. The benefit of the PMO is clear. So somewhere along the line, PMO idea of value started getting lost. And this, of course, becomes easy target. Now, as I mentioned before, PMO's um, life is actually pretty short. It's about five to five and a half years on average PMO. And this is one of those few things in life that being too successful successful is actually not necessarily a great thing. Of course, not successful. You could imagine why organization want to kill it. 
So the irony here is if you're too successful, most organizations have a limited institutional memory. So let's say you, the PMO is created because there's a lot of project failure and one executive decide come in, make a change, put in the PMO and everything worked out well. Fast forward a couple of years, the executive moved on and somebody else come in. And that somebody come in may actually even enjoy PMO, so it doesn't even have to be a lack of enthusiasm. But at that point, the organization now being this good, happy state for some years. And let's say the economy is starting to tighten and organization leadership say, well, we got to cut something. We have saved money. Uh, what do we do? Oh, look at that PMO. Why are they there? Um, nobody remember anymore because all the projects going pretty well. So they actually could get killed for lack of or short term memory. Um, and accommodation usually was something else like executive transition. PMOs by itself is often seen as an overhead. Uh, because itself doesn't necessarily have to lead project, even though some PMOs can. So as an overhead, of course, you are particularly vulnerable uh, anytime when there's belt tightening. Now, of course, not being successful as a PMO is fairly easy to understand. And I would be the first to raise my hand and say, you know, we got to make change or even kill the PMO if it's just costing company money, but not delivering true value. Um, so that's the not successful side. But by the way, I should mention, you know, uh, most of our webinars are designed to be interactive. So feel free to jump in with questions. Uh, you could use Zoom for those who just joined us. There's a chat box and you could just chat. All the lines are currently muted, but you could actually unmute yourself. Just unmute yourself, talk, and then I ask you to remute your line. If it gets noisy, I'll mute everybody again. So please jump in with questions uh, as you have them. So some words of wisdom for PMO professionals as we look at and based on our experience. PMO, as I mentioned, because it has a short term life, in order to really make that connection with the company, you have to focus both on the tactical and the strategic. Every win is a win. Low hanging fruits are easy wins, definitely go after them, but you can't lose sight of the bigger picture, where you're heading. So this is sort of the balance that PMO has to play. Be stay relevant, stay in people's eyes, in people's mindset. And if the executive thinks about PMO every time they have a question, whether on some prioritization, et cetera, then PMO is live in their mind and probably gonna be there for a while. On the other hand, if it becomes an ancillary function that people once in a while review a report every three months, that's probably not gonna be great. Um, the second is be vigilant value delivery. I think PMO has to essentially get out some pom pom and do a little cheerleading. Every time it delivers some value, it needs to talk about it, needs to boast it, needs to be in people's awareness. As generally speaking, a overhead, as I mentioned, that is going to be extremely important. And, and then the three is keep the process simple and lean. Any time that you could do things simpler. Ask the question, can we? Or you could sort of tailor the process in proportionality to the endeavor. So for example, in project management, we always have a charter, right? That's a best practice. And when I used to run PMO for large organization, I 100% of my project have charters. And people say, well, T, you even have a charter for a $10,000 project? I mean, do you really want to spend that time? I said, absolutely, without a charter, people don't have any mechanism to set that agreement between what the customer wants and what the project team is going to deliver. So at the very minimum, get that done. Now, getting that done, however, my charter could be a single page, sometimes even half a page, just a couple bullets for a tiny project. I just wanted people to put it, things down and that they agree. Of course, as you could imagine, as the project go from 10,000 to 100,000 to a million to 10 million to 100 million, and some of our projects are three, 400 millions, the charter size naturally increased quite significantly. At the end of the day though, I think the value of PMO has to be self-evident for it to be sustainable. When I say self-evident means people can really question it or really having major doubts about it. So this is my last bullet here, right? Now in your organization, Self-evident maybe means that it 
the benefit is more than the cost by two times. Definitely by sometimes you get to three times, it does become fairly uh, uncontroversial that's adding a lot of value. So you need to figure out what that sort of magic number is in your organization. But if the PMO return on investment is self-evident, then at least on the scale of value, it is unsell unsellable. I mean, they could still sell it in other ways, but not based on the value and contribution. So let's jump to sort of the next area, the type of PMOs. Now, there are many different categories of types of PMOs. So this is a non-standard type, but this is how PMO advisory looks at it. I think one of the first natural growth of PMOs, either the learning or the essential. The learning PMO is usually in a larger organization. It doesn't have to be huge. When I say larger, it just means that there's different pockets of project managers and they don't really have common practices. Maybe it's a diversified business, so the business lines are not even the same. But at some point, they do want to grow and learn um, and advance beyond what they currently do. Most organizations, especially if they're successful, likely go on this growth curve and become more mature and better what they do. So there's that learning PMOs I called about it. So bring people together, if nothing else, just to share the best practice. Find common trainings that the project manager would like in that organization. So to me, that's just a natural uh, a need of people. And typically, if it is a learning type PMOs, it's usually not necessarily initiated by the PMO itself, but initiated by human resources or talent management. They started having sort of a set of courses or collaboration forums or wiki around sharing the best practice, and this emerges out of that environment. The next three, the essential, advanced, and strategic, these are more built toward the intent of the organization as they have more project and more project intense environment. So essential projects, uh, PMOs, are what I consider some of the basic functions, capabilities that PMO ought to have. And without these basic PMO, it is really not an operational PMO. It could be a learning PMO as a natural organic environment, but not necessarily operating me directly adding value. The advanced PMO is taking on some more of these capabilities that goes beyond the basic. And you can see some of the th things I listed talk about governance, supply chain management, risk management. And then the strategic is very common within larger organization. And their roles is really becoming, helping the organization to make the right decision, not just getting the work done, but really helping to decide what work to do in the first place, how to mitigate certain risk. So here you could see a map that we created based on our experience of the value, strategic, tactical to strategic, and then sort of the implementation readiness of most organization from sooner to later. And in this scenario, you can see, think about the phase one, which is really the learning PMO, is sort of just the central body people getting together. Project managers around the company want to share a cup of tea, coffee, whatever, talk about their best practice, or somebody found a great training and they want to talk to and mention to the rest. The phase two, the essential PMOs, these are PMOs that's really already in some kind of operational value add. So they are doing reporting, metrics, issue management, status reporting. They're more passive in terms of the day-to-day, -day, you know, roll up your sleeve to do work. They're more responding to the actual environment and reporting on it. The advanced PMO, which we look at as sort of phase three in this setup, is when they do actually jump in and actually do work. So PMO itself is playing some primary role in impacting the project, even if it's not leading every single project, it's setting up the tools, setting up the best practices for risk management, program governance, so on and so forth. And then phase four is when the PMO itself becomes a part of that decision-making, resource management for the organizations, setting up the portfolios, looking at the prioritization of initiatives, and also extending to really 
ask the question, how can we improve the performance of the organization through projects in this case? So you have one, two, three, and four. Now, things aren't mutually exclusive, of course, and this is where we draw the line that certain capabilities, status reporting, for example, can eventually becomes more executive dashboard. So status reporting, let's say, for the entire company. Um, and then as you're able to get more insightful data and report at that executive level, so get rid of or consolidate a lot of the detail, now you become executive dashboard. And from there, you can use it to support, for example, creating of new businesses, new ideas, new projects that feeds into portfolio management for prioritization and ultimately getting to the strategic uh, execution office of deciding what are really the major and strategic initiative for the organization. So those are some of the evolution that we see. And a lot of our training is based on this idea of moving from the lower L uh, maturity to the higher maturity. Uh, and there are common processes to, to achieve and do that. PMO, by the way, is itself evolving very quickly. It's not really sitting in isolation. Some of the latest things that whether they truly work or not, or this is just a buzzword out there, that is still TBD to be determined. Um, but the notion is there and the direction is fairly clear. Uh, for example, Agile, as I'm sure all of you know, is impacting the project world quite significantly. Some people believe all projects should be Agile. Uh, I have to say PMO advisory is not quite there yet. I think there is actually a lot of value in traditional, but clearly there are a lot of projects that make sense to use more agile approach. And that is true even in the world of um, PMO. So there is this idea and notion of making the PMO processes more predictive, adaptive, and hybrid. They look for greater communication and transparency so they can manage change better. The second of these is the digital tool. Um, digital tool here, of course, get into the entire from the analytics all the way to artificial intelligence. And there's a whole range. So you could look at the digitization of you know, our general workforce and how does it impact the PMO. The digitization here, I think the flow is a little bit slower than I think some other fields, partly because PMOs projects are really one-time endeavors. The metrics around project aren't necessarily uniform, and they usually aren't that many data points that's truly of value. So while digital tools can greatly enhance collaboration, communication, and document sharings, et cetera, in terms of generating that artificial insights, intelligence and insights, that is still a work in progress. We may get there, but I think this is still right now in that interim state. And then, of course, the last idea of the PMO, as I mentioned, PMO self is a organic uh, growth. In some ways, people could look at PMO and just argue it's almost any type of central office um, that adds value in this case in particular to project. So PMOs can actually extend its growth and reach to what I call alliances with other PMOs or other similar units, um, and also really work with remote teams. So the idea of PMO in bringing a lot of people together to really strive toward achieving consistency, repeatability, common methodology, at least common language, common understanding, all in the name of delivering projects and program better, faster, more effective. I think that would be a natural evolution of PMO. And that's why in the last 10 years, we started seeing really this term enterprise PMO taking hold. Um, okay, so those are some of the latest developments. I'm sure there are others, and I would love to hear what you see, of course, as well. Steps to building PMOs. Um, and we talked about you know, the title of this building operating. So a lot of things we went through here so far are sort of the basic guiding principles. So next I'd like to dive into something more tangible. How do you build a PMO? And of course, in an hour, we only could do a very high level sketch of this, but we wanted to, you to walk away with sort of this idea, mindset, that building PMOs goes through multiple steps and does take some time. 
generally speaking, to build a PMO and for it to settle down and reach some level of steady state takes approximately six months to a year, depending on the environment you're in. So the five steps that we outline here are one, evaluate the situation, two, design the initial set of capabilities. So you got a you know, thousand mile journey starts with the first step. So what are the first steps? Pilot was the focus on making sure the organization adopted. I think too many people focus on, oh, what are the tools? How can we make this better, faster, better and more automated? I think those are great goals, but let's start with the basic. Will people even use it? Once you get to beyond that, then you kick into a full launch. And then of course, then operate the PMO. So evaluate the situation. As I mentioned, PMO is very susceptible to being killed. Um, it doesn't have a particularly long longevity. Five and a half years, I mean, some larger project could be five and a half years. Right? So in some ways, PMO, this life is relatively short. And this is because I think the business case in which it was built upon is either weak or lost that business case over time. So in this situation, you want to start out with something that's very solid. A lot of PMOs, by the way, are created out of a crisis. I remember one of my first executive job in PMO, vice president of, I think at the time it was called Program Management Office for Financial Institute, is when that Financial Institute um, failed to launch a major, major ERP software. Um, and the, they hired me to build that enterprise PMO. I reported directly to the COO for time and later to the CEO. So it was not a small PMO, it was an enterprise level PMO. And it really came out of a crisis uh, because the organization failed and the failure of that project, I think ultimately cost the company something like 19% of its revenue for that one year when it was written off five years later. That's how much the project cost. They were painful. So never let a good crisis to waste, by the way. So build a PMO, start with evaluating the situation, looking at the organization, identify the reason, why was it built? What are the major uh, objectives, especially low hanging fruit ones, because you wanna start out with a little bit more of a success so people could see the value right away. The second piece is there are a lot of capabilities. You know, going back to my earlier slide, this slide here, you can see there are about two dozen, and, and, and two dozen is not exhaustive either. So I'm sure if you start digging, probably come up with the third dozen, if not the fourth dozen, capabilities that organization can have. And of course, you can't build all that overnight. So the question becomes, what do we build? How do we evolve the PMOs? So here, you want to be very practical and start building what you would need to be successful at that earlier stage. And then you can, over time, build new capabilities. So start easy, looking at the gaps, looking at any missing criteria, look at where you can add the most value. And sometimes you have to be practical. What can the organization take? You may have the best of intention, but nobody's there really wanting to adopt your intention. So you have to try to demonstrate value as quickly as possible. The third, pilot. This is sort of my special flavor to project program, portfolio management, and PMO. Um, I'm a people person. I grew up in some ways confronting a lot of people challenges. Early in my career when I was at Accenture, I was in their um, organization change practice. Uh, they called it organization change or change management competency at the time. And the biggest thing I learned is most of these changes that we do, whether it's through system or some other infrastructure or some business process change, Ultimately, you need people to use them. You need people to operate them. You need to people ideally embrace them in their heart, not just in their body. If they show up to work because they do the things they have to do, that's really not getting the full benefit of whatever you're trying to do. What you rather have is people are spend a lot of time up front communicating, navigating, training them. So when they're ready to do the job, they say, this is the job I want to do. Right? And of course, sometimes it's a little hard to get there initially, but striving toward that goal is important. So in my third step, as I put here, is pilot with that focus on adoption. 
It is really not about the system. It is not about the process. It is not about idealized vision what you want to achieve. It's more practical. What can you get people to do consistently? What is the first baby step? And then once you start with that training, coaching, and mentoring, and people start using it, then you can refine it. So in some ways, this is more agile in its thinking. You'd rather have many little attempts. Try something A. Okay, it doesn't work. Let's tweak a little bit. You got B. Okay, it didn't work as well. But let's make it C. And eventually, people will start adopting it versus coming out with a brand new set of process using very strong arm forcing people to do. So I think piloting this uh, is a great idea. Uh, the other benefit of pilot is because the virtue of the word pilot, it usually means things haven't settled. So it gives the people the sense that they still have ownership, they have the ability to make changes versus that you communicate a fully refined set of processes. And then at the right time, with that initial set of capabilities, you could do a full launch. Now, full launch depends what it means in your organization. If you're building a department PMO, maybe the pilot and the full launch is the same. But if you're building an enterprise PMO, then the launch could be in one or two departments. The full launch, of course, can be in the other rest of the departments. Again, extending what works. Now you have hopefully a core team of supporting you from the pilot, and that gives you now more support as you roll out to the rest of the organization. And then finally, once you get into this operational mode, um, that it is indeed delivering the intended value, there are numbers of activities to consider making sure that those success are sustained. Going back to what was said earlier, PMO have an average life of five and a half years. Right? So you probably want to be on the longer side of that scale. And this is where we are now next going to talk about the four, I think, basic key activities to really ensure the success of the PMO. So I think this is a good logical place. Let me just pause here to see if there are any thoughts or questions. Okay, I see there is one question, I think. Is there a way to download the slide after the presentation? Um, sorry, I know the question was asked privately, but I'm sure other people asked the question. We generally don't make our slide available. Uh, there's a variety of reasons. Sometimes we have PMI, intellectual property, we are REP, we are allowed to use it. Uh, other times there's just some degree of sensitivity. What we do do though is we make the video fully available. So you can see the video and it will be posted at pmoadvisory.com backslash webinar, probably within a day after the presentation. Okay. So, but if there's a special need that, that you really like to have a discussion, feel free to email me and you'll have my email address at the end, but it's pretty simple. It's TWU at PMOadvisory.com. Okay. So let's moving on to the um, operation. The first uh, of these activity, focus on execution. All involved team members should focus on execution by applying the correct established processes. So it reinforces one another. It's always a bit hectic and overwhelming at the start, but it comes by easier. So what you really wanna do is take good habits, good practices and make it into good habits and follow through. Execution is a very broad topic in the sense is that there are many, many good rules communication, transparency, follow through, having good metrics, having good support, answering questions, customer questions quickly. All of these makes the processes, whatever initial processes that you establish, that much easier. So later when we talk about, we have some couple of courses coming up, we will look at how to be, for example, more execution ready. The second is continuous monitoring. Um, the PMO itself is really an operational unit. And what you need to do is there are a lot of moving parts. So the monitoring controlling is really focusing on applying the process to identify gaps and address them quickly. If you see that there's an issue, a team is not adopting the process or having difficulty using it, even though they really want to use it, then jump in and help. 
Um, so having that hands-on practice, helping people to make things happen uh, is becomes invaluable. So there's a question. Um, thanks, Steve. Given the relatively short life PMO generally, how can an organization incentivize project managers to take leadership roles given their likely higher level of risk? That's a really excellent question. I think that question is actually beyond PMO, uh, unless the PMO is the performance manager of the project managers. I think the short answer to that is, is the organization want their people to take risk, and I assume calculated risk, not just random risk, then they also need to develop a performance scale to make it worthwhile for them. And those performance enhancements or recognitions or rewards could be bigger title, more opportunities, uh, promotion, recognition, more training opportunity. In the context of the PMO, and again, depends a little bit on what type of PMO you have, there could be a lot of added incentive to give to that person. For example, if the PMO is uh, the sponsor of a community of good practices, make that person one of the leads, give them more, let's say, editor rights to the blogs uh, versus just a average contributor or reader right. So there are different ways that you can do. Uh, the second part, question, I think that this may especially true in consulting organization where project manager may be a revenue source for the company, but at the higher level may be considered somewhat overhead and cost. And that's absolutely true. I grew up in consulting organization. I mentioned earlier Accenture, I was at KPMG. Um, I was even at a smaller company called Handshake Dynamics for some years. And so I, I think the trick for the organization is as the organization grows, they need their people to grow with the organization. And they really not only to provide sort of passive training and send people out to training, but also be actively engaged in that person's career development. And making sure that the right training, the right certification, also have the right recognition. Uh, one of the clients we have, um, they make rockets, uh, literally rockets going to Mars. Uh, what they have done is they start out with quite ambition. They wanted to put, um, in this case, PGMP, Program Management Certification, on individuals' performance um, roadmap, meaning that in order to get promoted to a certain place, they have to have that certification. And by the way, practically everybody in the organization already have PMP. So PMP is already considered a table stake. Uh, unfortunately, there were actually significant pushback from a variety of sources. I think the organization was slightly, parts of it was even unionized. Um, so the HR backed off on it, but they did get agreement to make it highly, highly favorable if the person were able to attain the PGMP. Um, I just heard a story, I think it was Saudi Arabia. I could get the country wrong. Oh yes, America, uh, the Saudi Arabia oil company, unfortunately, right in the news was the drone attack. Um, one of my colleagues from uh, Middle East was telling me, in that organization, if you achieve PGMP certification, your income is guaranteed at a certain level. So I think translated to American dollars was equivalent to about $200,000. So if you have a PGMP, your income would be no lower than that dollar amount. So, you know, talk about incentive. If imagine your organization say, hey, if you guys have PMP, your salary won't be lower than X. And if it's PGMP or risk management or portfolio, you'll be, you know, another quite favorable number, I'm pretty sure people will be incentivized to do so and probably even stay with the organization because they're playing above the market rate. So those are some ways that I, I could think of. Okay, hopefully I answered the question. The third step um, is in, in this case um, from the operation is PMO itself is a organic um, entity. It needs to constantly evolve. And the evolution can go a number of ways, but one of which ways is climbing that maturity curve. The maturity curve, which we will have a separate course to talk about it, but essentially think about it as going from a set of random processes 
Um, so first of all, you start with even knowing what the process and the capabilities are. Then you have some idea how to do it, but probably five pe different people do it differently. So you have now the stage of the process itself and the values being determined, but the steps are still relatively uh, uh, specific to individual, a lot of idiosyncrasies. So that's generally, we call that sort of level one. From there, you get into standardization. So the organization of the PMO try to do things more effectively by having a standard set of processes, you get to maturity level two. And from there, then you could build on making it more efficient by automation, applying tools, streamlining. Eventually you try to make it more hard hitting, more poignant to the problem you're trying to solve. So on the level four, you look after the effectiveness. And then you build it onto the more continuous improvement. So slowly as the organization climb that maturity curve, at least in this case, um, you become a lot better at what you do. And of course the metrics will show up. And then f finally is the, so this is what I sort of explained before on that maturity curve, right? So the general recognition on level zero, sort of more ad hoc, having a firm definition, standardization, going after how to make it work, scale it up to this level that you need on the efficiency. Once you get there, then you hone in, customize it, tailor it to the organization to make it more specific. So effectiveness, and then ultimately getting to a side that you can constantly looking to improve. And then that is the fifth step, improve. Um, the pro one of the problem with PMOs, and because the longevity is relatively short, is sometimes they outlive its usefulness. Uh, maybe a process, for example, for prioritization projects, prioritization of ideas, works beautifully in one, two, and three. But because the market dynamic, the com company is hiring younger people, millennials clearly in the workforce. And by year five, that what worked well in year two and three becomes antiquated, very bureaucratic, very slow. And on top of that, your competition is moving faster. So your ideal pro ideation process is no longer no longer suitable, the time to market is too long. So in this case, you're always constantly looking to optimize the process, to keep up with the Jones, so to speak, but in this case, keep up with the market, keep up with the culture, keep up with the people. Um, and so there are different ways to improve, of course, but ultimately things shouldn't necessarily be settled and stayed uh, the same over a prolonged period of time. And I think it's just because this comfort level that people sort of into this, oh, this process work, it worked great, let's just keep it. And then after a couple of years, sort of the bureaucracy kicks in, the process itself becomes a little fatter, where it started out maybe a simple form, now has a couple more questions, a couple more questions, next thing you know, it's a whole catalog of questions. And so that PMO now start getting the bad rep. And by year five, six, or seven, it becomes more and more vulnerable to, to that change. So what are some of the next steps? I see we're coming close to the up uh, on the hour. Um, for those of you that's interested in learning more about PMOs, uh, learn about our experience, how we use really more basic consulting approach to help build as well as lead PMOs. We have you know, a couple courses that we're thinking of doing and that's coming up in uh, later this year and you could see that. So this slide shows you some of the courses that we are currently offering in the month of November and December. Um, the half day courses I mentioned is our series around insights. The primary idea there is develop sort of that perceptivity and the distinction that you can make the sermon between X and Y. So we plan to focus in that three hours around really the capability, a deeper dive into the two dozen capability you've seen and sort of the maturity that we saw that one diagram. The PMO as a strategic enabler, really making the PMO work for your organization, that's really a one day course. And we plan to offer them two different sessions. One is a physical class in Northern Jersey, and we can limit that to only maybe 10 people. And then the second is a live virtual delivery, which we could have a couple more people the next day. So if any of you are interested, um, feel free to sign up. And right now is a special offer. We're making $100 off for any of those classes. So 219 becomes 119 and so on and so forth. So you can see the site here to visit and to get more information. 
Are there additional questions? Okay, I see another question. Great. Consulting firms are project organization. What can PMO learn from how they run their project, project-centric business? Um, I think it's a good question, but it's a very broad question. The consulting organizations are somewhat a little bit different than at least the average PMOs, partly because they're running a business as well. Um, so the minute you throw in this sort of engagement planning with profit and loss into the PMO, it changes the equation uh, slightly. It doesn't mean it's not effective, of course. PMO can clearly be built by consulting organizations. I think the biggest thing that PMO can learn from consulting organization is the sense of resources, budgets, um, and really the funding. Because most of the PMOs I built, I built as a consultant. I built either when I was Accenture, KPMG, or elsewhere. So there's the clients quite looking after their you know pocketbook, and they rightly ought to. So we almost never have the full resources and the budget and the time to do all the things we want to do. So I think learning from the consulting organization, if you're building an internal PMO, is to have that sort of mindset, that knowing that the organization have finite resources. And ask the question, what can you do more with less? What can you do to make it faster, deliver value quicker, so the client, in this case internal organization, appreciate the value, and that will give you a little bit more leash to develop more the strategic value. I have never, uh, with one exception, developed a strategic PMO from the ground up, mainly because it, it's not proven. If you tell the executive, we could have all this kind of data to drive our decisions around that, it works in a vacuum. The, one of the very first questions, they said, it's great, T, sounds good. Can you help me develop this for this narrower context? So it always starts with a pilot. Um, the one exception is one of the entertainment company, they really had a portfolio strategic support function. So they're really more building a portfolio management office. So in that case went straight to be a very strategic one from the very beginning. But generally it built really because most likely people comes in, uh, as I have some clients doing right now, T, we have 20 project managers, we need about 50. Did we have too many projects, what do we do? Right. Those are the more common scenarios. People are running around like headless chickens and trying to get some sense of uh, organization. Uh, so that's what I see. The other, by, by the way, the, the often gets called is, you know, when projects are really failing or fail to start, which is a failing another way. Um, we have a client that trying to start the ERP for some time now. I think sometimes measuring years. And they somehow never able to really get it off the ground. In this case, they're not looking to build an enterprise PMO. They're looking at actually more of a classic program management office for that particular sort of um, major system ERP type implementation. So hopefully I answered that question that what PMOs can learn from consulting organizations. Other questions? So I'll pause here a little bit, but again, we'll put this um, video up and you should probably forward to sort of the tail end because this can contains the code in which you can claim one PDU for your time. Uh, you can see this is 50.5 tactical, 0.25 strategic, 0.25 leadership. And this is the claims code for those of you who have PMPs uh, or other certification. Here's my contact information. Um, if you really, really want to have the deck and you want to uh, ask for it, please, you can email me uh, in some selective cases. We generally don't make it available because again, the intellectual property involved in it, um, but on certain needs, we can make exceptions. I just heard a sound, are there questions? Well, what I hope is people enjoy this class um, and uh, this webinar, I should say, and come back for more. Um, PMO advisory, uh, consider ourselves to be a leader in this field. And we not only look at PMOs, um, we look at after portfolio program management. So our range of experience are fairly broad. Can you please reshare the PDU slide again? Absolutely. Okay, are there any other questions? You can unmute yourself or use group chat. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I'm going to end the meeting. Going once, twice, 
Excellent. I'm now going to stop the recording. And um, as I mentioned, if you want to...